they did this to you. They're trying to turn us against each other. Just look at them. What do they know about friendship anyway? I'll get them. You watch. I'll take care of those sons of bitches. Watch it, Alan. I'm shooting. Oh, good Lord. It's... It's unbelievable. It's... It's horrible. I can't understand the reason for such cruelty. It must have something to do with some obscure sexual writer. With the almost profound respect... These... Getting very careless. Blood in your hair. What will we do? You want to look pretty, don't you? Pretty for me. I can't believe you're not afraid. All you have to do is piss on it. Could he care blood, ain't you? God damn it, Ralph, get out of here. Go on, get. Leave people alone. You'll never come back again. Oh, shut up, Ralph. It's got a death curse. Evil. God, my leg. God, my leg. I'm here. You're here. There's a fog bank out there. Messenger of God. You're doomed if you stay here. Demanding everything, including blood. John, I want this material burned. All of it. So he was one ruthless son of a bitch. Wendy, stay away! Darling, light of my life. I'm not gonna hurt you. You didn't let me finish my sentence. I said, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. I'm gonna bash him right the fuck in. <laughs> well, Dad, are you proud of me now? Do I measure up? Huh? My son, my son was a son of a bitch. And he was no good. That's it, my son is dead. I don't want to talk about him no more. Oh, Cindy. Oh, Cindy. You're gonna die. Elliot! Elliot! Mater Ma'am. Mater We didn't find any boy. Mater Suspiriorum. You know as well as I do, it takes all kinds of critters to, to make, make farmer Vincent and fritters. <laughs> I wonder who the real cannibals are. Hi, this is Art Ettinger, the editor of Ultraviolet Magazine, and it's my pleasure to be here with the esteemed Dave Parker to discuss one of the all-time greatest romantic comedies, House on the Edge of the Park. Uh, boy, oh boy, I know you love this one. This is you know what really stems me seeing this movie at again, 15, 16 years old. And all those movies have stuck with me. That's when I know they're classics. If they stick with me until I'm an adult and I rewatch them and love them. So again, we're talking about another Diodata movie um, filmed the same year. Uh, co concurrently with, I believe he was filming some of this and everything like this. Uh, I guess the big thing here is uh, the cast is amazing. It stars David Hess, Giovanni Lamberto Radice, um, Lorraine DeSalle, uh, Chris, Christian uh, Balmero, never say his name right. And um, who, geez, who else pops up in here? That's pretty much the big cast, right? And David Hess's wife at the time. Annie Bell. Annie Bell, yes, yes, from Last Hunter. Okay. Ugh. And um, here's a pro tip that will make you so smart. It's like the first time you learn how to pronounce Jean Rowan. So a very, a little known fact. When saying Giovanni Lombardo Radice, his whole last name is not Radice. It's Lamberto Radice. And you see that wrong all the time. Even in like 
the top genre publications, they'll be like, Radice said. And it's like, come on, do your fucking homework. His last name is Lombardo Radice. And um, so now you all know. It is like a very important distinction. Of course, he just likes to be called Johnny when he's in the States. But um, his last name is Lumberto Radice. And um, you've now been educated. And it's like learning how to say genre long. Once you say it, you can just <laughs> turn your nose up at the people who call him Gene Rollin or whatever they're yeah. fucking it up with. I used but, to make um, that mistake on John Roland, and I sure, definitely made the mistake fine. on Giovanni Lombardo Radice until you corrected me. I used to try it, and then it was a mouthful. So I just say, you know, I used to John call Morgan. him John Morgan because that's I was fine. a lazy fuck. Well, that's not wrong, though. John, John Morgan's not wrong. You know, and sometimes for fun, I'll refer to the movie as being directed by Roger D. Franklin. So <laughs> or, <coughs> or the, credited. the director of the B, uh, Seven Doors of Death is Louis Fuller. Yes. Um, <laughs> here's a true story that um, Scott Gabby, the creator and publisher of Ultraviolet Magazine, in all honesty, without trying to be funny, called me up one day and asked me if I was familiar with the director Wolfgang Schmidt. He's like, I've been watching a lot of Wolfgang Schmidt movies lately. Wolfgang Schmidt, of course, being a common um, alias for Ray Dennis Steckler. And okay. like, and you know, and th this is not like before the internet like scott could have just looked it up and seen that it was rated this but he's like you know this wolfgang schmidt it was so funny it was one of my like between that and the time that he found out that ralphus from blood sucking freaks was dead he's like we should interview the midget from blood i'm like dude like no interview but anyway um now i'm embarrassing scott but that some of the most hilarious conversations i've ever had about movies were with um and are with scott but in any event um House on the Edge of the Park. One of the things that I wasn't brushed up on until we did this audio commentary for Severn, the um, movie came out on VHS in the U.S. very close in time to when Last House on the Left first came out on VHS. And so when I was in middle school and renting House on the Edge of the Park, um, it was a pretty new video release at that time. And I saw it very early on in my movie renting like sixth, seventh, eighth, somewhere in middle school, I saw it. And that would have been, I started middle school in 1986. So I saw it like right when it came out on VHS pretty much. And boy, did it make an impression. I mean, it was one of the few uncut, in your face, nasty movies that you could just get wherever, you know, not as easy to find as something like I spent in your grade, but pretty close. Like a lot of video stores had it. It was a big tape. Vestron was taking off the year after, um, House on the Edge of the Park came out is when Vestron really struck gold with Dirty Dancing theatrically. I mean, that's a Vestron picture. So I've never watched Dirty Dancing, but no, uh, the cover art to uh, House on the Edge of the Park, the VHS, it's one of the coolest cover arts of all time, hands down. Um, so literally David Hess is the star of this one. And the story is, you know, he got half the what film rights or something like that to be in it. And it was well worth it because he shines in this damn thing. And he, he proves why he is the best baddie of all time, I'd say. Although he only really was a baddie in four movies, as far as I can, you know, big roles as far as that. Uh, yeah, uh, the plot of this one is people say it's a Last House ripoff, but the only similarity is it David Hess and there's some rape in it, right? And, and the, the ending, you know, instead of wandering into the parents' house, they were set trapped there is kind of the only thing but um alex and ricky are two working class um bad guys i guess you'd say to a certain extent and they are invited to a rich people's party and they beat and rape and torture the guest more so alex until there is a inevitable twist and a climax in a swimming pool, which I find very funny because the same year, Don't Answer the Phone, with Nicholas Wirth, also had a climax in a swimming pool. And then they both were in um, Swamp Thing in 1982 together. And I really wish I was a fly on the wall when one of them said, hey, did you get shot and fall in a pool too? Don't forget, Last House on the Left also has a swimming pool scene. Oh, fuck. I, I didn't even register that. That's so weird. I've watched Last House, you know, a handful of times, and I've seen House on the Edge of the Park a dozen times, probably more like 25 times. And Don't Answer the Phone half a dozen times. And I'm sitting here, and I never registered the fucking pool with uh, Sadie Bites. The pool is one of the things that's often referred to as borrowed from Last House yeah, on the Left. Yeah. Sadie Bites it in the pool, doesn't she? 
Um, that is where Sadie gets killed. Yeah. You want to be careful when you say bites it because there's a literal <laughs> biting of it by another character. In that movie. That's a, so, there's a different bite it too. Yeah, you don't yeah. want people to be like, that's not the biting. They'll get confused. You they'll know? get confused. They'll have to bite it's, something. It's like all the douchebags who say there's no burning and I spit in your grave. Pay attention. There's burning. She people burns are like, clothes. she doesn't burn burn any of the guys. Well, she doesn't burn any of the guys, but she burns his clothes close enough shut the fuck up already about that there's no burning like that's every pencil neck fucking like anyway whatever i um i get angry i get you angry should be about complaining about the five because there's only four that's there the only, only complaint four, you can have. but what if there had been five that's the thing <laughs> <laughs> but yes there's only four this um, woman just burned what's it what order is it this burned, woman has just cut chopped broken and burned five men behind beyond recognition but no jury in America would ever convict her. Now, to quote my good friend Lewis Justin from Massacre Video, there's probably some juries that would convict her. Oh but, yeah, um, for sure. Uh, he, especially he's the first in Texas. Person. <laughs> yeah, he's the first person to have said that. But uh, I wouldn't. House on the Edge of the Park is movie magic. Again, there's people who are dismissive of films like this, and that makes me so angry. And those people's favorite movie is always something stupid. I, I guarantee you. If someone doesn't like House on the Edge of the Park, their favorite movie is a worthless fucking mainstream stupid fucking thing. It's not one of the cool ones. It's something. The Conjuring. It's not The Conjuring, but I'm not going to name what it is. <laughs> I don't even hate it. I'll but I'm just kidding. alienate half of your audience. But like certain movies just are like played out. And then, but the people who are so confident, I remember I was doing an introduction to House on the Edge of the Park on 35 millimeter the first time I got to see it on film at the Salt City Horror Fest. We borrowed Tarantino's print. I'm on stage and I said, you know, all these glowing things about it. And there was this guy in back, this like fucking like stereotypical like loser. And he starts making faces and like, and I just like from the stage was like, sir, what's your favorite movie? You know, like, oh, you don't like it? Like, it's like, you're like, oh, like you're that guy. And I'm going to fuck with you right now because we're about to see House on the Edge of the Park on film. And you're fucking rolling your eyes because your favorite movie is, and I'm not going to give why examples. Why is he here? Why do you show up to a movie you don't? Yeah. Why like do you on show? Film? Why do you show up? Why do you yeah. take up a seat, bro? Well, there were other bigger movies playing at that festival. He was probably there for RoboCop. You know, um, I, mean, I love RoboCop, but I'm not dissing RoboCop. But like, it, I got but it's saying. exactly someone whose favorite fucking movie is RoboCop who's going to diss House on the Edge of the Park. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that yeah. is the kind of movie I mean. But anyway. But, RoboCop's got a lot to it, but so does House on the Edge of the Park. We got RoboCop is not in like my top like 500 movies of all time. I'm not dissing RoboCop. But, I'm, like, just saying, I'm just saying. I'm just yeah. saying. I was gonna. I was gonna use this as a segue because it has all the you know the satire. But House on the Edge of the Park on the surface level, people just think exploitation nasty. But I'm sure you. Um, also, I should mention it's Bruce Holchek and Art Enger who do the commentary on the Severn. They do a good job. It's a very great release. Looks way better than it fucking did on the old Code Red Blu-ray and the old Shriek Show DVD. And I'm sure the VHS or the fucking bootleg fucking uh, multi-pack that you had that you watched once and hated the movie because you couldn't see fucking David Hess's afro. Um, so here we go. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. We have the, um, the, obviously the, um, the, the politics between them, the, the whole, uh, rich versus the poor versus the working class, which sets up a lot of weird feelings, which Diodato is perfect for, right? Because you have the horrible imagery, the beautiful music, but now we have these horrible characters that you start to side with after they're at the park. You see Alex rape somebody right in the beginning. Right. And then when he gets to the party, you see how the rich people treat Ricky. So you're thinking, well, fuck them too. Maybe I want Alex to hurt these people. So you have this, this dichotomy within you and, and it just really can, he likes to fuck with you. He likes to make you side with bad guys and, and make you, you know, hate people that you shouldn't all sorts of shit. Right. I just, again, am like, call me sick, but this is what I want to see. Like when I want to like whatever mood I'm in, if I'm happy. If I'm sad, if I'm angry, if I'm not angry, House on the Edge of the Park, that's my comfort food movie. Like, you know, like uh, the music, the cast, the colors, the lighting, the like, oh, man, I, I used to have a hard time getting through it. I have to put the remote on another part of the room. Otherwise, I'll just rewind and like watch like the same lines over and over again, just because it like cracks me the fuck up. Like, I love this movie. And. I'll admit it's not for everyone, okay? But it's for everyone cool. It's for everyone with taste. Like, this is... If someone's like, 
fuck house on the edge of the park. I'm like, I don't think I want to be in the same room with you. You know, like you're not, you and I, we're not friends. We're not going to be friends. I'm not going to like you very much. No, I don't respect your opinion. You're an asshole. Um, I've seen house on the edge of the park on film a couple of times. I recorded. I'm glad I did um, at the drive-in when I saw it um, at the Mahoning drive-in. The audience response, it was a nice night. There were a lot of people outside of their cars. The howls and applause when David Hess gets shot in the crotch at the end. A great audience moment. But um, yeah, it's a tough movie, and but in the best ways. You know, it's really a uh, mean-spirited movie, but also just like a lovable movie. And, um, you know, it, it's not supposed to make you smile, but it makes me smile. So It's also endlessly quotable, again. Um, a Diodato man, his dialogue you, underestimated. Um, like all the all the lines in here, and David Hess wrote a lot of his own lines, my understanding, because how couldn't he? The way he delivers them, the way he is about yeah. it. I'll also bring up uh, Giovanni Lamberto Radici's first movie, and he did three this year. All of them are fucking gangbusters. All three of his performances are gangbusters, and he has a certain quality about him. A very um, the word I'm looking for is no matter how bad or, or you know bad things he does, he has a certain innocence about him where you feel sorry for him, especially in Cannibal Apocalypse or City of the Living Dead, and especially this one. Ricky and Alex's relationship is something that drew me in right away because although Alex is a sociopath, he cares about Ricky, and there's some sort of relationship there. And, and Hess said in the special features, he said, is it father, you know, is it best friend? Is it father, son? Is it homosexual? Maybe. Maybe it's all of it. Maybe it's just no actual sex, but that that kind of relationship that a, a loving relationship would have without the sex, you know what I mean? A prison relationship. Well, do you, um, you know, I don't know about Giovanni Lombardo Radice's character, it's unclear, but David Hess is a vet in the movie. Yeah. They don't like, I should, it, it's in your face in as much as he wears a dog tag. They show it in his hand in the beginning and you can see it in some of the shots, but also the Cindy O Cindy song. It's an old folk song and that's an anti-war song. That's a song, you know, if you listen to the lyrics, that's what it's about. So um, it's pretty clear that he's a vet. Was Alex at war with him? I'm not sure. I don't necessarily think so. I also think that Giovanni Lombardo Radice himself has said that his own sexuality maybe comes off in some of his performances. And, um, you know, he certainly is um, someone who um, appears on film to be not straight. Um, and so him and, him and David Hess's dynamic in that movie definitely has a sexual vibe to it, especially given the sexual energy flowing throughout the movie. I mean, oh, that yeah. is... Um, that is a sexual film. Uh, it really freaks people out. I think it's the ultimate Euro Sleaze movie. Um, and it's just like movie magic um, from the sets to the music, to the performances, to the zany dialogue, to the violence, to the over the top nature of everything, every character says and does. It's just a wonderful wild ride of a film. and. I um, I'm so glad I got to do that commentary with Bruce. Yeah, I think we nailed it. Bruce and I are a great team. We've done three commentaries now together, and um, I'm very happy to be be um, on the same the same team as him. As far as like we really see eye to eye and have a similar sensibility to these movies. You know, we're, we don't laugh at them. We're not so bad. It's good people. We genuinely adore these films, and so yeah, we um, we have a great rapport. We talk movies all the time anyway, so for us to do, it's like being a fly on the wall in our phone conversations when you hear one of our commentary tracks, so. Yeah, the music in this movie, the, the Riz Orlani score again is, it. these songs are the ones that um, I catch myself being stuck in my head. Um, if I had to have a song that I whistle the most to me, it's uh, um, much, much more, or the, I do for you. Yes, do um, it to me once more, yeah. yes. And, and the lyrics of that song, to me, are essentially just David Hess's inner monologue, how he feels about women. I do for you anything you desire, because he, he has to have that control, and he takes what he wants. So a woman, I, he just sees them, and to him, they think, I do for you anything you desire. And it's just, I've always felt that way, and it, it brings a real emotional level to it for me. Um, and again, the first time I ever saw this movie, um, I was very on easy how to take David Hess's character because he's awful and he, he has to go. He has to die. 
but I was genuinely sad um, when he did only because the connection he had with Ricky and that speech he gives it's such like a deep meaningful thing I mean he is the only son of a bitch that could take such a sociopathic piece of shit and make him you get him on your side get on the side you know what I mean like he's just such he he's had so much screen presence he's got so much charisma and all three of the ones he did like this are all great movies and a huge part of it is because of him um, House on the Edge of the Park, Hitchhike, and Last House on the Left. They're all great movies, and he stands out. He is also, while those characters are admittedly quite similar, <coughs> there are some differences, and he does play those differences um, quite well. And uh, Hitchhike is a, a, probably the most underrated of the three. I think it's often overlooked. Um, and... Um, you know, I think a big part of it is that that was another movie that was not released here on VHS and the VHS heyday. Um, if it had been, it would have been a huge hit, hitchhike. But um, that contains some of the best David Hess lines. Like, I like when he calls Frank O'Neill a fucking pizza eater. You know, it's like, <laughs> what's a, what bigger insult, you know, to an Italian? You fucking pizza eater. It's hilarious. The line that always stuck with me, and I haven't watched Hitchhike in probably 15 years when he's like, my dad wouldn't give me $2. Two dollars for a football. I think goes. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I know we we're talking about that movie, but it's also got the best headshot of all time because it goes through a fucking motorcycle home, and I had never seen that before. I actually thought that was so cool when I was a kid. I was like, "Dad, get in here, check this out, watch this guy." <laughs> My dad was like, "Oh shit." Um, yeah. So, like I said, this movie again, the soundtrack is wonderful. Um, and for an isolated location. It's a lot of like, you know, pot, like they're, they're doing the sex plays against each other and all this stuff and playing like a weird fucking cat and mouse all of them the whole time. But for one location, it never gets boring to me. Um, and the only negatives I've ever heard people bring up are that there's no possible way that David, that um, um, Christian would have known that David has killed his sister. But we have rich people. And he mentions he saw her in the club and was bothering her in the club. It doesn't take very much for a rich guy to go to the club and say, what was my sister? Who is she with before this? That guy, he's always here. He sees the fucking necklace around him. Boom, I got it. It's, it's pretty easy. You yeah, Bruce, um, Bruce Holchek and I are on team. We're on the team that believes that the movie does earn its twist. And that if you watch the movie knowing the twist, there are like a lot of references to it. It is... Um, it is a smart movie. It doesn't cheat. And uh, whether there's a knowing glance between characters from the beginning on, yeah. you know, it's it's set up fine. Um, and people who are surprised by it, well, they weren't paying close attention. But, um, you know, I do think it's a lot. There's, so you have rape revenge movies. You have confrontational movies. Then there is also a subset of movies that are in one way or another inspired by Last House on the Left. You have Last House knockoffs, some of which are closer, like um, Night Train Murders, for example, is a very close Last House knockoff. But then you also have almost any movie that was like mean in that time period would have a campaign like Last House. Like Last House on Dead End Street, it's not a Last House knockoff, but it used Last House yeah. in its retitling and in its campaign cleverly because it was a mean movie, they, that's how they got people into the theater, so. Well, even Bay of Blood, wasn't that renamed Last House on uh, the Left Part Two? A lot of movies, yeah, New House on the Left was the Night Train Murders. And then sometimes- <laughs> It's not a sometimes, fucking train, it's called New House on the Left. <laughs> yeah, right. That's so fucking stupid. Yeah. Um, one of the best titles for that one was Xmas Massacre. And um, there's cool artwork for Xmas Massacre floating out there. But um, yeah, I, um, like I said, recording that commentary, we definitely had a lot to say about House on the Edge of the Park. But I um, I think one of the things that really make made it such an important movie for me personally was how young I was when I saw it. It's wide availability on VHS. That is a movie that was everywhere. It was easy to rent. And it was uncut. There's only one version of that movie, as far as I know. You know, are there censorship issues with it in some countries? Probably, but like um, in the U.S., you had the one version. It's uncut. Um, it has the Cannibal Holocaust font in the opening credits. That's the same like yeah. title, um, which you know, for a nerd like me, that goes a long way. Um, but um, 
you know, House on the Edge of the Park, really. It's another movie. You can tell a lot about a horror fan by what he or she has to say about that movie. Um, there's, there's people who are really dismissive of a movie like that. They think it is sleazy. They think it's dirty. They think it's grimy. Meanwhile, you know, like, they think that um, John Carpenter's The Thing is like Kurosawa or something. But, oh, wait, I said that out loud. Oopsies. Um, I, I love The Thing, but... but... I get what you're saying. The one thing that I noticed this time around, again, I had a first time viewer here, right? What when I watched it with a first time viewer. So, you know, you're watching it and you're and it was the first time I was watching a seven Blu-ray. It looked great. I'm looking over at him watching it. And you get to that uh part with Cindy, right? And he uh has the straight razor. And that scene is like ten fucking minutes long when he sings a song and wonderfully sings it too, by I might add. And then he he go when he proceeds to cut her, it was just so goddamn uncomfortable, especially watching it with someone else. And that's the kind of feeling you want. You like I said, I enjoy movies to make me feel like shit because I don't know. That's how I feel. That's how I feel alive, I guess. So I was just watching that, and my friend was like, it, it, "It's so fucked up because she looks so young too." And, and that was just generally casting. Um, it, it's just such a powerful scene um david hess's actual joy he gets from hurting her the the sadism when he that goes the cut and he cuts to him and he's got hmm, like that again those little moments like i said really kind of add to a performance so it, it's not just a performer performer's job for a good performance to come through it also is the editor and director to pick what choices there are because we all know an editor can destroy a good performance and, and save a you know make a save a bad one. But I'm just saying like that those little moments like that and that uncomfortability. Like I, it's hard to put into words why I like this so much without just saying I'm a sick person. <laughs> I don't think people. I don't think being into sick things makes someone a sick person. I don't see myself as a dark person. I'm one of the least violent people you'll ever meet. I've never been in a fight in my life. I've never hit anybody in my life. I'm an extremely nonviolent person, but for whatever reason, violent entertainment really gets me going. I like it a lot. And I don't think there's some deep psychological reason for it. Um, I just have an appreciation for what other people might call dark in, in, um, in works of art. But um, I was David Hess as Alex and I was on the edge of the park for Halloween. And that was one of my first adult Halloween costumes in a long string of bizarre Halloween costumes. and. That was really fun being, um, getting to play Alex and cosplay Alex. Um, you know, I don't see myself as a cosplayer. I just said that out loud, but playing Alex for Halloween was a lot of fun. You should go um, to Comic-Con like that. Right, I'm, I would fit right in. I would fit right in. But uh, no, I think that um, I understand and I'm sympathetic to the fact that there's a sliver of viewers. There are some viewers who just can't watch rape scenes. Maybe they were raped. Maybe there's some, maybe like, but there. that's a very small sliver. Besides those people who really can't watch cinematic rape, besides those people, House on the Edge of the Park gets the top recommendation, you know? Um, it is movie magic. It is exactly what I want to see when I go to the movies, so the one thing that I always made a joke about, like, and I noticed it myself when we were, we did this top 50 favorite horror directors, right. And Diodato's on there uh, for sure. George Romero is my favorite personal director. And I saw all these movies young, you know what I mean? So they leave, you know how that is. The movies you see young are the ones that stick with you. And I saw almost all of my favorite kind of horror movies before I was probably under, under 20, you know, 20 and under. So the thing about it is when I, I, I said, if George Romero taught me that racism is wrong, Diodato kickstarted my interest in sadism. <laughs> That's how I said, like, because at least his film is concerned, right? So, so I just always felt like that was a weird thing, like seeing those movies so close. I don't remember which one I saw first um, was it House or, um, man, I probably got them together. I probably bought those tapes together and saw them around the same time, 15, 16 years old. And for some reason, those leave a lasting impression on you. So I, I went, my friends had some negative things to say about it. They liked it. Um, but I'm just bringing up negative points that I would counter argue. They thought that the idea of inviting Cindy over, like, did they invite her over or she just stumble over by herself? But the, when she shows up, she acts like she was invited. And like, why in the fuck would they invite her if they knew that Alex was going to be there? And I said, my guess is it's a translation issue that she showed up out of the blue. And when they translated or dubbed it, it just didn't come across correctly. I mean, I think like she was just, they had forgotten that Cindy they was going to stop by like two weeks ago. 
Yeah, or maybe she just dropped by, but yeah. If they say specifically that she was invited, I think they just forgot to call it off. Like no one, while they were under attack, thought of, yeah. oh, let's call it off, you know? Yeah. So like a couple of these actors didn't go on to do too much. Uh, Harold, um, Howard, Howard and um, the African-American uh, woman weren't really too big prolific actors, but Annie Bell, um, French, so you call her Annie Bell, that's correct, right? Um, she was yes. she was in a handful. I think Last Hunter ended up making the Video Nasties three list, right? I believe it did. That's a great movie if nobody's ever seen it. And, um, I know she's in a few more. Um, then we also have, of course, Christian, um, who's in Tenebrae, another Video Nasty, and, and Stigma. And so he had a little small career too. But what what else was Ani Bell in? Well, Ani Bell was in a lot of erotic films. Was in like films for a period of time, and then she left the industry. The one actor OD'd. The yeah. um, the one woman was from Martinique and she ended up in the movie because Ruggiero was sleeping with her. And there's a brief shot of her in the Concord affair. And um, we talk about that on our commentary track. As of when we found her in Concord affair, she was not yet credited in the IMDB as being in it. Um, we'll have to fix that, but she is seen in Concord affair. That's where Ruggiero met her. Um, so yeah, she was beautiful and very much a model, but not someone who had intended on being in films. She actually owned a hotel in Martinique. Um, so she's not African-American, she's from Martinique. Oh, okay. And, um, and um, beautiful, beautiful woman. Um, and she is briefly seen in Concord Affair. So um, a little Ruggiero trivia, okay, he was sleeping I'll, with her. And also Lorene DeSalle obviously go on to be in Cannibal Fair Ox with with Giovanni Lamberto Radice. Um, uh, did they have a good relationship? They, had they were to close. Been. They were close friends, yes. I, I yes. thought so. Um, so. So like I said, Hess is the shining part of the movie, but I love Ricky too. And like uh, the, the speech that Hess gives in the musical, um, I don't know. The musical points where all the scores come in and everything, it just really evokes emotion for me. Like I said, it's just, and I'm not the first one that I, I've heard say that. Other people have told me that moment when Hess gives that speech, they get chills up their, their spine. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right, and definitely. Like, that, that's kind of something that you live for. A movie that can give you chills, it, it's a rarity, right? And then something so awful as this, I mean, it's kind of special. Um, again, one of my personal favorite movies. I know it's one of your personal favorite movies. And I, I've, I've talked about this before. And if you guys haven't checked out the um, new Severn disc, I recommend you get it. It has subtitles for fucking once. It looks way better than the other edition. It has a soundtrack with it, which I did put in when I cleaned my house. I listened to it twice, back to back. It's not a long soundtrack, but everyone's a fucking killer. So yeah it's a it as has a commentary on there it has some also some new features as well um interview with the, was it the cinematographer on that and there's a new interview with uh, the set giovanni. designer yeah, yeah. There, and there's um giovanni's on um, there too the new one right the replacement disc also includes the trailer they left the trailer off the first release and so people when they got their replacement disc they didn't highlight the fact that they added the trailer but they added the trailer so it's, it's a great a really, trailer well cut trailer too it's one of my favorite trailers i'll watch that one and the original cannibal holocaust trailer was actually an excellent trailer as well because it's like these are men men like you cole it's better to be in the warm ground or the heart of a warm man instead of the cold ground or something like that yes <laughs> um but no uh house in the edge of the park is probably one of the most brilliantly cut trailers you know what i mean and a good trailer can leave a, a lasting memory of uh, can kind of leave you having a warm fuzzy feeling about a movie even more so if that makes any sense Sometimes you, sometimes you reference the trailer before the movie. Um, like, I, I don't have that much to say. Like, I feel like um, I've talked about this movie a lot before and I always give it a perfect rating. So I, I'm good on House on the Edge of the Park. Um, as far as it uh, stacks up against other 1980 movies, it fits right in there, along with Cannibal Holocaust as being probably one of the most mean-spirited hardcore years in horror of all time. Took a um, long time to play here. House on the Edge of the Park might be a 1980 movie, but... It was reviewed in Variety on the same day as Back to the Future in 1985. Oh, but shit. it was the same page, Back to the Future and Cannibal Holocaust reviews. But it um, it started playing a little bit before that, I think in 84. We have the dates on our commentary track. But no, definitely one of the high points of 1980. When I think of 1980, I'm definitely dancing to the House on the Edge of the Park soundtrack. So It, it always gets stuck in here. And I'm going to play the soundtrack during this whole whole thing right here so everybody gets it stuck in their head and again it's all beautiful music um 
there's like I said, nice little touches when uh, Howard uh, pulls Hess out of the pool and he says, Cindy, oh, Cindy, you're going to yeah. die. And he throws him back in the pool. Is this a nice little touch? Like there's so much good stuff in here, just little touches. And of course we should mention, you know, that they show the working class guys at first as being the most evil. But then as it goes on, the you think that they got the upper hand because Hess is such a clever, smart guy and he never loses. You can tell he's just a, he's a big gorilla, but he's smart too, right? He never loses. But then when the rich people get the upper hand, you realize that they're probably even worse or at least Diodato wanted them to seemingly be worse um in, in a lot of ways well, and yeah the final line at the end it's sort of like uh, you know you enjoyed it it's sort of like that movie is i wonder who the real cannibals are you know um <laughs> you're right it's a perfect a perfect analogy so and i know people sometimes feel that line in cannibal holocaust is cheesy I know we're bringing that in, but I, I think it, I think it's so perfect. Not to me. Like, love it. I, don't, I love it. I don't laugh at the movies. Like people laugh when they're saying let's boogie. And I yeah. might be like, eh, you know what I mean? But that's not like, I don't laugh at Bob and house on the edge of the park. I don't spend four hours making fun of Bob. Like I can't get through Bob. Oh. It's like, you guys are fucking spoiled rotten. You have no idea. Just like, I don't, I don't know. I don't get hung up. Maybe I'm on the spectrum. I really do think I'm on the spectrum somewhere. So I don't notice these things like other people do. But I'm I've never No, that, been... that's so bad it's good people can go get fucked. They can go, you know. Um I, I don't particularly worship the boring mainstream movies that they do, you know. Yeah. Um you can have your maritime drama with your men on a boat and I'll have House on the Edge of the Park, thank you. Um so um that was a that was a Jaws dig. I have no problem with Jaws, but it's like <laughs> It's like the kind of person who will say the greatest horror movie of all time is Jaws will tell you how much House on the Edge of the Park sucks. And I would rather watch House on the Edge of the Park than Jaws any day. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's movies that you I know of objectively are amazing movies and I like them and I rate them highly. But when it comes to personal taste, it's, it's my favorite movie is not Jaws. Jaws doesn't make my top 20 favorite horror movies. I'm sorry, it just doesn't. Alien might, Texas Chainsaw might, but not Jaws. Not Exorcist. I'm sorry. I like what I like, and I like fucking gore and zombies and grindhouse and crazy shit and goofy shit too. So it's just what it is, man. It's and it's somebody argued. A friend of mine argues that he says the best, the favorites are the best. He only like I don't and I don't get that right. Like I've objectively looked at a movie and be like that's a that's a perfect movie, right? But I still like Spooky's better, and Spooky sucks, but I like it. I don't know how to say it. It's just the way it is. I can relate. I can relate. All right. So I appreciate you doing this. I kept you. Uh, we we're both a little tired, both a little rambly, but I hope you guys like this. Um, check out that Blu-ray from Severin. Day one buy. I already have my copy. So, and, and if you buy it from Severin, you'll get the replacement disc. No need to worry. It's a hot one. And I uh, it's one of the best Blu-rays in a long time. So check it out.